Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan, and today we have episode one of a seven episode series on lighting and photography. If lighting and photography seems like a rather broad subject for a video, um, that's because it is. It's a very broad subject, and it's why I've decided to do this in seven separate episodes. Today, I'll be explaining what those episodes are, because my number one priority in doing this series was to make it maximally uh, practical. In other words, I want every bit of this information to be something that you can use in your own photography. I want to answer all of those tough questions that come up over and over again. But before I give you a breakdown of those episodes, let me first of all thank my Patreon supporters and thank the people who have so generously donated through my website. Uh, something like this, a series of videos like this would just not be possible were it not for the generous contributions of these fine people. And there's a place you can go here if you want to join their number. I hope you consider doing it. So let me walk you through the seven videos so that you can know what to expect. In the first video, I'm going to do what I'm doing now and lay out the series for you. And that's primarily so that you will know where to go to find the information you're looking for. If you don't want to sit through the whole series, I cannot imagine why you wouldn't want to do that. But if you choose not to do that, you'll know exactly which video to go to and where to look for the information you're seeking. In this episode, number one, I'm also going to cover a few general principles that are going to come up over and over and over again for each of the light sources we discuss. And I think it's probably stuff you already know. It's also stuff that's going to be, I think, a useful reminder as we get into some more of the detailed stuff going along. And if you're new to photography, this will be crucially important. We're going to talk about things like color temperature, white balance, light intensity, and so on. All the things that we're going to be coming back to over and over again. In episodes two through six, the middle five episodes, I am going to deal in each video with one particular source of light. And in each of those videos, I'm going to talk about where the light comes from, how it's made, the way photographers use it, the common applications for that kind of light source. Then I'll discuss the pros and cons of that light source. Then we'll talk about how a given light source can be best modified. We'll be talking about diffusers, reflectors, flags, snoots, soft boxes, all the things that are practical that you need to know if you're going to be able to make the best choice about the lighting you want to use for your given subject. So we'll cover that for each of the light sources. And then as a bonus, at the end of each of those five videos, I'm going to talk about how that light source that we, we discuss in each of the videos may or may not be useful in macro photography and give you some specific macro pointers on where each of these light sources can come into play in your macro. In episode number seven, the final episode, we're going to do two things. We're going to look at a couple of special cases, lighting in microscopy and lighting for video. And we'll have to cover those fairly superficially, but I think there'll still be some useful information in there for you if you use either of those uh, modalities. And then in the second half of video number seven, I'm going to lay out for you what I believe are your best practices for lighting and macro photography. Basically, I'll take everything that we discussed during the series and I'll boil it down into a set of recommendations for what I believe to be the best practices for using light in your macro photography. So let's jump back to the middle five videos again, and let me tell you what each of those covers. In video number two, we're going to be looking at 
the light source that started it all off, the sun. The same sun that almost burned the top of my ears off. In episode number three, we're going to be looking at light that is generated as a result of heat, specifically incandescent light. This is an incandescent light. This is a good idea. <laughs> this is a broken light bulb by the sounds of it. In episode four, we're going to turn our attention to light that's produced by a combination of electrical and chemical reactions. Fluorescent light. It's absolutely fascinating and it has more useful applications than you might think. In episode five, we're going to look at the fascinating case of light produced by semiconductors. I am, of course, talking about light emitting diodes and the dizzying, bewildering array of forms these lights take and how we can use them, the pros, the cons, what they're good for, what they're not, and of course, how we can use LEDs in macro photography. In episode number six, we're going to be looking at the last remaining source of light, which is the high voltage ionization of gases in a specially coated tube, flash photography in all its glory. Speed lights and studio lights, the difference between the two, how we use them, when we should, when we shouldn't, how to use them in macro, and just a whole bunch of other useful information about flash. So that is what you can look forward to over the coming weeks. I have been really excited about this series of videos and I think you're really going to enjoy them. Let's cover a couple of uh, brief points that I think will make everything else we talk about over the coming weeks a little bit more sensible. What, for example, is light? Light is electromagnetic radiation. It's the same stuff that make up radio waves or microwaves, x-rays and gamma rays. Light is the same stuff as invisible infrared and invisible ultraviolet, which lie on either end of the visible spectrum. The visible spectrum of electromagnetic radiation is a tiny sliver right in the middle of a very long spectrum of energy. In this diagram, you can see that there is a great variation in the wavelength and the, uh, the energy content of all of these types of electromagnetic radiation, but only a tiny sliver in the middle is visible to the human eye. For the sake of the coming discussions, I will from time to time refer to infrared and ultraviolet, and I will probably call them light as well. If Physicists tend to call all electromagnetic radiation light, so I think we'll, we'll get away with it. But don't be confused. These are invisible forms of electromagnetic radiation. The energy in infrared, especially as you get further towards the far infrared end of the spectrum, there's just not enough energy in that radiation to fire off the cone cells in our retinas. So a nerve impulse isn't produced and our brain doesn't register uh, seeing anything. The fact that our retinas can pick up certain wavelengths and not others does not mean that there aren't plenty of creatures crawling around that can see infrared and ultraviolet. It just happens to be the way our retinas are constructed that we can't. The spectrum of light that we can see changes as we grow older. Actually, it changes as we grow up. Uh, very young uh, children can see parts of the spectrum that we can't, which explains my imaginary friend, I think. The other end of the visible spectrum is ultraviolet. Why can't we see ultraviolet? It certainly has plenty of energy. Well, the reason is almost all of that light is absorbed by the cornea and by the lens in our eye. Uh, basically protecting the, the retina because uh, ultraviolet light would damage the retina if it was able to get through. 
Instead, it damages the lens and the cornea and causes cataracts and other eye problems. So that's why we don't look at UV. We're not going to talk about those parts of the electromagnetic spectrum outside of that narrow band of visible light, a little bit of IR, a little bit of UV, as it pertains to photography. Let's talk for just a second about wavelength. This is important and will come up again, just because we will often refer to a given color of light by its wavelength. The visible light spectrum is roughly between 400 nanometers, that's the length of a wave, uh, up to 700 nanometers. The easiest way to remember it is if, if it's between 400 and 700, it's, it's visible to the human eye. A key to understanding light and electromagnetic radiation is to understand that the shorter the wavelength, the more energy and the higher the frequency of that energy. So when we talk about visible light spanning from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, the 400 nanometer light is short wavelength, high energy, that's violet. Just for a little bit of context, the visible light is from 400 to 700 nanometers. The highest energy gamma rays are 0 0.00001 nanometers in wavelength. That's the rays that just kind of cut right through you. <laughs> we won't be messing with those. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, as the wavelengths get longer and longer through infrared and into microwaves and eventually to FM radio waves and AM radio waves, way out on the far end. We're talking about um, a wavelength of about 100 meters. Why is any of this wavelength malarkey important to photographers? Well, because light is a blended mixture of energy in these different wavelengths, light has some properties that make photography possible. For example, when light travels from one medium to another, it slows down. The speed of light out in deep space is 186,000 miles per second, theoretically as fast as anything can be. Light doesn't travel that fast in the air. It doesn't travel that fast in the water, and it doesn't travel at all in the middle of a piece of granite. So as light passes from one medium into another, say acrylic, it bends. Now, it doesn't always bend. If the light hits absolutely perpendicular, it'll just go straight on through. But when light hits a prism at an angle, the higher energy, shorter wavelength light is gonna bend more than the lower energy, longer wavelength light. And what that means is some prisms give you the ability to spread the light out into its constituent parts. So obviously all of this is very important for lenses and how we use them, but it's also gonna be important for the light that we choose. And I'll get into all of that over the coming episodes. This is probably a little deeper than we need to go, but it's so fascinating. I'm gonna take a minute to, to describe what's called the wave-particle duality of light. When people were trying to figure out what light was, they settled on it being some kind of a wave, much like sound waves or waves in water. And that was mainly because experimentally, they could see a lot of the same results, like interference patterns that we've talked about before. So light seemed to be a wave. But then as, as we learned more and had more accurate testing tools, it started to appear as if light was actually a particle, a chunk of something. Even though we couldn't demonstrate that it had any mass, it acted as if it were a particle. So what is it? Is light a wave or is it a particle? Well, thanks to the work of people like Max Planck or the Planckster as we used to call him, it's both. 
the most contemporary understanding of what light is requires some understanding of quantum physics because a photon is now considered to be a quanta of light. It's a packet of light and that packet has waves. So it's both. Think of it this way, light travels in waves, but as soon as a piece of light hits an object, it becomes a particle or it acts like a particle. So that's the way we'll think about it. You have to think about it that way to make any sense of how your camera's sensor works. So the color of light is a property of the light itself, and it has everything to do with how that light was produced. That will determine the color or the tint and the hue of the light. When we talk about the color of the light, we're talking about the relative mixture of the different wavelengths within that white light. For example, if there was something in the atmosphere that was reflecting or absorbing blue light, for example, as happens as the sun is setting and the light is coming obliquely over the horizon, it's traveling through a great deal more atmosphere, the photons are striking a great deal more um, particles in the atmosphere, molecules or dust particles or clouds, and it's filtering out a lot of the blue light. So if we break down the spectrum for the light that's hitting us at five o'clock in the evening, in my neck of the woods anyway, what we'll see is a very warm light, an orangey, reddish light. Similarly, on a overcast day, the light looks slightly bluish. And that is because the energies in the longer wavelength range around the oranges and the reds are largely being reflected off the atmosphere. And what's getting through is the higher energy light in the bluish end of the spectrum. So by the time the light gets down to us, it's changed color. Now we use a, a, a scale called the Kelvin scale to describe the color of light. Now that comes from experiments that were done uh, many years ago, again, by Max Planck, who imagined this, this theoretical black body, which is a, an opaque object that reflects absolutely no light. So it's just sitting there. He discovered that if you heat that object, theoretically, as it reaches certain temperatures, it will start to give off light. And that's the concept that we use to describe the color of light using degrees Kelvin. So when we say that the setting sun has a color temperature of 3200 Kelvin, what we're basically saying is that if we took a black object, one of these idealized black objects I just described, and heated it to 3,200 degrees Kelvin, that's the color it would put off. It would glow like a sunset. And that's why we use those numbers. The scale of Kelvin, by the way, is exactly the same as the Celsius or centigrade scale. It's just moved 273 degrees to the left. And the reason for that was there is a very important temperature in physics that's called absolute zero. At absolute zero, all of the particles in, a, in an ideal gas stop moving. It's the point at which movement ceases. You can't get colder than that. I don't think you can get colder than that. So the temperature at which all motion ceases in an ideal gas is kind of important for physicists, but 
I don't think they, they wanted to keep calling it, oh, it's minus 273 degrees. So for their mathematical calculations and what have you, they set it as a new scale and that's zero. But the, the increments in the scale are the same as centigrade. Does that make sense? It, you can forget about it now. We won't discuss that again. The most important point of this, obviously, is that we understand what the various color temperatures of light are. To give you a couple of examples as a, a frame of reference, a candle burning will give off a color temperature of about a thousand degrees Kelvin. A sunset, maybe 3200 degrees Kelvin. A clear white sun on a not overcast day, maybe 5600 degrees Kelvin. And then a light overcast sky might be 8,000 Kelvin. And a dark overcast sky where everything is looking bluish, that's usually up around 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Another way to think about color temperature and the color of light is white light is close to an equal representation of all of the energies or wavelengths of the light. So there's as much 400 nanometer light as there is 700 nanometer light as there is 500 nanometer light. They're all blended. They're not. They're, <laughs> they're not. But we're going to think about it as if they were because it's, it's more convenient. It's, it's a useful heuristic. So we're going to say that all the, the energy levels are equally represented. When we talk about color that is not white or light that is not white colored, what we are saying is that one or another area within the spectrum is being overrepresented or underrepresented. A great example of this is the light given off by the, the first few um, generations of fluorescent light gave off this horrible greenish light uh, because there was a spike in that area of the energy that's put off by those old fashioned kind of lights. And that's how we describe the color of light. And it's very helpful because we have to understand that if we're gonna be able to correct for different colors of light in our photography. There are two things that determine the color of something. Take my shirt. Please take my shirt. <laughs> my, the, the nature of my shirt is that it absorbs all the wavelengths of light that are hitting it, except this shade of lime green. But that's only because I'm sitting in a studio with 5,600 Kelvin lights shining on my shirt. If I did like I did last week and went for a walk at sunset, we have pretty amazing sunsets here. And last week it was really, really orangey red. Uh, the color temperature can't have been 2,800 degrees. And this lovely lime green shirt started looking like a mixture of infected bile and baby poo. More, more of the poo than the bile, but you get the idea. It was revolting. So understanding the color temperature of the light that's hitting the object, as well as understanding the nature of the object will determine the color. So most of us are familiar with the color of skin. Well, not my skin, the color of an ordinary human being's skin. It looks skin colored. But if you go messing with the, the temperature of the light that's hitting it, it can start to look pretty horrible. Let's take our fluorescent light again. The old fashioned fluorescent lights made human skin look dead, uh, which is why they never really caught on very much. This is important because in order to correct color, in other words, to white balance an image, you have to understand the light that's hitting it as well as the subject that's being hit. And that's all that white balance is. So we correct the colors so that human skin looks like human skin, not like alien scales. And that my shirt looks like 
trendy, modern, sporting shirt and not a nappy. One last thing before we go. I have decided to keep the science of luminance and brightness and the energy content of light uh, to an absolute minimum and just use the generalizations that we use in photography that are more than good enough for the conversation that we're going to be having. So instead of talking about lumens and lux and candelas and nets and what have you, I'm going to be talking primarily about exposure values and occasionally guide numbers and other simple shortcuts for describing the intensity of light. I think it makes more sense. We can get into the science of, of luminance at another time. This series of videos is really about comparing the common available sources of light for our photography. And as such, I'm not sure it'll be very helpful for us to get bogged down in the absolute measurements of this or that type of light. So if you're thirsting for a, an in-depth discussion about candelas and lumens and lux and on and on and on, We'll do a separate video and it'll just be you and me, but, but we'll do a separate video. So that's it for episode one of our lighting and photography series. In video number two, we're going to be talking about sunlight and uh, it will be a much more practical discussion than today's was. And uh, I think you're going to find it useful and interesting. If you have any questions, leave them below. I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. If you don't belong to our Discord group, go over there and sign up. We'd love to have you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for liking. Thanks for commenting. If you haven't subscribed, please do. If you haven't hit that notification bell, please do that as well. If you have a public presence through social media, or if you have your own YouTube channel, if you write a blog, if you do any of those things, please consider posting one of my videos or mentioning one of my videos in your own stuff. My channel has stopped growing and the channel that is not growing is in danger of dying. So if you can help, I would be most appreciative. I'll see you in a couple of days when it's going to be you, me, and a big ball of flaming helium in the sky. Until then, take care, be safe, see you soon. Bye.